Well, I'd like to welcome you here tonight to uh, hear from Joe, and I'm so glad that you're tuning in. Uh, it's an exciting uh, time, and Joe Fenton is here, and Joe is going to be leading in just a couple songs so that you can hear him and uh, hear how he sounds, how he plays, all those things. But more than that, I'm hoping you see his heart as he leads these next three songs, uh, just the heart of worship that he does have. And so I just want to introduce you. Here's Joe Fenton. Joe. Thanks. I guess we'll do a first <laughs> yeah. Little, first little. yeah, don't get too close, man. <laughs> the jump, right? There we go. It's horrible. We live in uh, extraordinary times. And, uh, and so when we turn to God's word, we have an extraordinary God. And so this is what... Uh, the psalmist writes in chapter 62, uh, verse 5 to 8, and uh, I hope you find some peace in this. This is what he writes. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Let's come to him in, in prayer. Dear God, uh, even though this is a summit and it's kind of like meet Joe, uh, at the end of the day, it's all about you. It's about your glory. And so, Lord, through our time together, would you be honored and, and exalted high? Would you become the focus of our heart and our mind? And uh, it's not about me on one end of a camera and others on another end watching, but rather together you unite our spirits uh, in worship. And so, God, thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I pray that people will be blessed as we uh, learn about each other. And so uh, we just lift this time into your hands, Lord. Amen. Let's sing about God's faithfulness together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, the forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, my hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin, and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness 
faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto You know, we talk about how every generation has stories of what they've gone through. And uh, there's no doubt about it that what we're currently going through is going to be a large part of our experience and our story. And as believers, we have this incredible opportunity now to actually show our faith, show our hope in God uh, himself through all of this. How can you have peace? How can you have joy? How can you have a view to the future? And the reality is, is the love and the goodness of God. And so there's lots of stories out there. It's, uh, it's my prayer. I'm sure it's your prayer that uh, once we get through all of this, and even while we're in it, uh, we would be able to tell great stories about our good, good father. Well, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Good, good Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways To us You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, your love so undeniable. I, I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love, you're a good 
good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us so there's a there's a new song that uh, we posted online. It's called Faithful Now. And, you know, it's so just so appropriate uh, when we're talking about and thinking about uh, now God is faithful. Like, even now. And no matter our past, which is we anchor down into our relationship with God in our past. And we can go, yeah, I think I can trust God for my future. I'm good with that. But when the storms of life are swirling now... <laughs> That's when our, our faith needs to hold fast. So um, it is a new song. It's new to me. Uh, so let's just try it together and, and see how it goes. Good with that? All right, here we go. I am holding on to faith Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it Cause you make mountains move you make giants fall and you use songs of praise to shake prison walls and i will speak to my fear and i will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then you'll be faithful now And I am standing on your word And calling heaven down to earth And you will fight my enemies And this will end in victory And I will believe it Yes, I will believe it Cause you make mountains move And you make giants fall you use songs of praise to shake prison walls and i will speak to my fears oh i will preach to my doubts if you were faithful then you'll be faithful now if you were faithful then you'll be faithful now and i know that i know you never fail yes I know that I know you never will and yes I know that I know you never fail and yes I know that I know you never will cause you make mountains move you make giants fall and you use songs of praise to shake prison walls and i will speak to my fear oh i will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then you'll be faithful now because you make mountains move 
who make giants fall and you use songs of praise to shake prison walls and I will speak to my fear oh I will preach to my cows that you were faithful then you'll be faithful now oh you were faithful then you'll be faithful now you were faithful then You'll be faithful now. Thank you, uh, worship people and BAC family for joining us in this moment and this time. And uh, I pray that you've been blessed. I know that we have uh, some other things in store, some question and answer period with Scott. And uh, some of you have sent questions in. Uh, very exciting. I don't know what, what they are because Scott won't tell me. But we're going to have fun together. And so uh, thank you for joining. Let's just close in prayer and then uh, the guys can edit it accordingly. Dear God, we want to thank you that uh, even today, as we come, as we join in this kind of odd way that we're not used to, uh, that you still unite us with your spirit that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are in your love and we are your beloved. And so God, may our identity rooted in you give us peace in these times of chaos. And uh, may we as a church still cling to each other for support, reaching out, uh, but most of all, pointing each other to you and your faithfulness. And in all of this we pray, amen. BC, thanks for hanging out. And I'm sure we'll meet uh, very soon. Bye for now. All right. Well, it has been uh, good to hear Joe lead us in uh, a couple songs here tonight so that you could hear him. And this has got to be perhaps one of the strangest uh, candidating weekends ever in the history of candidating uh, because of the fact here we are. We're going to do an interview. And other than a few awesome people who are taping this, there is just chairs here in our sanctuary with us. But we're going to move forward with that. And uh, we have gotten some questions from you. Thank you for sending those in. But I want to start, Joe, by just asking you to talk a little bit about your heart for worship. Sure. So uh, actually, it's interesting. When I was growing up, I was very involved with music throughout our church and, uh, and different aspects of it. But as I kind of grew, grew through Bible college and into pastoral ministry, that idea that worship is one of the only ministries in the church that applies to every age group. <laughs> it encompasses different styles of music. It's also one of the only ministries in the church that actually continues into eternity. <laughs> and so that captures my imagination. Uh, I love how it's also a ministry where art can be involved and developed. Uh, that idea of um, taking your senses, uh, sight, sound, uh, I've even done services where we had smell as part of it. So that idea of uh, engaging the whole person. Uh, I've always been fascinated by that. But at the end of the day, the idea that what we do, whether it's worship in preaching, worship in prayer, worship in scripture, worship in song, that every part is about exalting Christ. And I mean, that really is the call of our lives, is to glorify God uh, in every part. In, in every way, in, in what we do think, say. And so um, that engagement is what really kind of drives my heart in that. Yeah. Oh, great. Relational. Relational engagement with God. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Joe. Um, all right, uh, a question came from Heather, and she wants to know, is there a specific reason you've chosen to go from a senior pastor position to a worship of creative arts position? Yeah, that's a great question because it, you know, in our Christian culture, we seem to have this idea, and it, hopefully it's fading out, but it still seems pretty um, prominent in churches, that there are certain things that you get hired to do, certain ministry positions, and you're on this kind of ladder of success. And so <laughs> you could start off at being a youth pastor, but you'd be down here. But we're, what you really want to do is work your way up to be the senior pastor, because once you've reached that level you've really attained. And so I've always thought that ministry is more like uh, workers coming to uh, the master's vineyard. 
and different servants get assigned different plots. And so for a season, uh, I did church revitalization. Uh, while I've been in, as a solo pastor, when I was in Orangeville, uh, we did church revitalization, church structure, church, like kind of taking two congregations, merging them, and, and making them one. So it was very um, heavy, complicated work, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And now I feel I'm in a season where God is moving me to a different field. But it's a field that I've been in before. <laughs> so it's not like a new field. It's just calling me back to a different set of skill sets and passions. Okay, so, so would you sense, and I, I have a question from Sean, that there's a calling to Bramley Alliance Church for this role. Absolutely. I mean, if you know, if any of you have talked to your uh, leaders about Grip Berkman, I don't know if that's a term that the church is familiar with. No, probably not. Okay, so there is a personality assessment that all of your pastoral and staff have done, and it assesses passions, gifts, wirings, all that stuff. And um, for a long time now, I've been functioning in areas that God has called me to, uh, where my interests of music and art in particular were not what I was hired to do. And so the call to BAC, uh, which I'll share in my testimony, um, was actually that kind of craving and calling back to the passions that I have that, that are just sitting in me that need to be responded to. And I love the staff here. So it was uh, <laughs> it was pretty easy uh, when you're addicted to the BAC staff to uh, want to apply. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you to say. <laughs> All right. Um, creative arts. That creative arts side of things uh, within a church. Uh, when you think of that, what, what comes to your mind? Yeah, that's a great question because creative arts can cover so many different areas, right? I mean, it can cover everything from uh, a set on a stage where there's a sermon series going on and you want to capture kind of that visual imagination or enhancement to the idea, the concept that we're learning about God, all the way to dramas all like that you've done at the Rose, uh, dramas, skits. Um, this past Christmas, I had a lady in our church actually do paintings during the worship time that um, were actually based on the theme of the sermon. So I, I think there's, it's endless what you can do. It's just you need to be able to see and, uh, and honestly try to figure out what gifts you have in your congregation to use. What has God gifted, in this case, BAC, for the enhancement of the arts here? So, so. You, you would think about trying to fan the flame of people's gifts and Absolutely. abilities. Okay, oh, yeah, cool. For sure, yeah. Passions cool. are important. Right on. Well, you mentioned the rose. Interesting enough, um, when you think about the Lord calling you here, and if I remember correctly, you were actually at last year's yeah, performance. This, yeah, this past year's. Yep. yep. Uh, so you have a bit of an idea of what we did this past year. Uh, how do you see coming into that and uh, realizing that would be something that would fall on your plate uh, to give leadership to? Just give us your thoughts on that. Like, what does that look like to you? Yeah, you know, to do that type of ministry production <clears throat> requires so many different skills and gifts and a massive commitment. Like, it can't be one person on a staff that carries it off. And the fact that last year's Christmas production was done with such an incredible passion and level of excellence, I, I think as long as people see and believe that it's being effective in the community to get the gospel out there, to reach people, to spread hope and love uh, and uh, all, of, all of what we want to communicate. I think that's something that, you know, we would continue to do because it was pretty great. Yeah, no, was, I, I mean, you're the, the preaching to the choir here. You I guys crushed it last year, right? <laughs> so uh, I think we just build on that. Yeah. Okay. Now, is that something that you would see yourself leading or like how... I know you don't know our church family sure. as of yet. You know a few people because yep. you've been working with them a little bit. But um, are, are you a team player? Like, oh, yeah. I mean, okay. Talk to me about that. Okay, so, I mean, in this case, uh, I've already had a conversation with, um, with one leader in particular. Well, two leaders. How did it go? You know, what were some of the, what were some of the great things that happened? What would you want to change 
for a different experience next year in terms of teamwork and basically coming in and, and, and just hearing people's hearts and experiences and then moving to help as a team grow and build, move forward together. I, I think coming in and being in charge of it, <laughs> I, like, well, uh, no, we all do it together. Like, so it has to be a group effort. So cool. if I can help come in and coach and provide clarity and give leadership, that'd be awesome. Yeah, right I'd like that. Okay, um, this is a question that I got asked by numerous people. And it always comes with uh, kind of an air of concern. Uh, it's a question around uh, what would you do when it came to song selection, uh, style? Uh, would, could we expect you to come in and change everything and, and maybe uh, move away from singing some hymns? In fact, Sue East asked if, uh, yes, I'm, I'm calling you out, Sue. <laughs> Will you play hymns? Like, what's your thoughts? It's a, a reasonable question, and, and you know, I think the fact that I'd be coming and joining in um, a ministry that's already very efficiently running, even the fact that I'm coming into it is change. Uh, in terms of like song selection and hymns in particular, um, one of the things that my wife and I enjoy is bringing hymns back to churches We've done that in a number of ways. We've done that through bringing back hymns uh, with, I can't promise every single Sunday there's going to be 29 hymns, but with regularity, uh, bringing hymns back because there's some great hymns, just like there's some great choruses. And there are some bad choruses. And believe it or not, there are some hymns that aren't great either. Theologically. So, theologically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and so... I think, you know, that is a great question in terms of, like, what do you choose for music? So I'll be honest, like, I've been on this kind of journey in terms of song selection, looking at what is the song actually saying? This is probably going on way too long, but I'm going to do it anyways. So there was a great article. <laughs> Shush. There was a great article <laughs> that came out uh, not too recently, or it was recently, and it was, it talked about be careful that the people that write the songs, be careful they don't form the theology in your church. Hmm. And we have really gotten into a kind of a worship pop culture where some of the songwriters speak theology louder than pastors do and, and more than the elders protect. And so I think looking at good theology, I love the changing of the pronouns. I like changing the pronoun. I like songs that talk about I'm singing to you, God. Like you, I'm singing to. Versus a third, like I'm going to sing about God. Because when we are in worship, we really are engaging God who is there with us. And so this idea of, if you can imagine coming into a circle of friends and everyone talks about you but never talks to you. It's very okay. awkward, yeah. right? Yeah. And so this idea of being very careful about our lyrical content that we are including the very God that we claim is with us into the discussion and into the exaltation and worship. I think that's, I think that's really important. Yeah. Cool. Well, Joe, I had a number of questions um, just around uh, kind of like, uh, would you have like a, a, a code of conduct, uh, a standard for those who are going to be involved on the worship team? And I, I know this is not really the place to go into deep detail on that, but just your thoughts on uh, if, if someone was coming to you saying, hey, I want to be a part of the worship team, like what kind of things would you ask them as far as making sure like, hey, yeah, it, it, would, be, it would be good to have you on this team in leadership because anyone who's leading on the stage, is, it's actually sure. a role of leadership. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, going out, like standards, that kind of stuff. Any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, the first kind of standard that we look for, and I know this isn't always popular in churches because we, we want to seek to remain open and inclusive, but really the first benchmark is, do you have a relationship with God? I, I mean, how are you going to stand, sit, play on a stage and lead the people of God who have the presence of God in them? How are you going to lead them into exalting him if you don't have a relationship with him yourself? Worship ministry is not an evangelism tool. 
<laughs> so worship ministry, worship ministry can be, but not for the people that are involved in the worship team. <laughs> yeah, okay. And so uh, worship, you know, speaks and calls people, you know, come to the Lord. But in terms of the people that are giving leadership on the team, they need to, they need to be developing in their relationship with the Lord. Now, of course, we can't ever expect and we should never expect perfection, but I think we want to encourage progression. So I think that idea of, you know, how are you, how are you growing in the Lord? Um, you don't have to be perfect. None of us are perfect. <laughs> Maybe Michelle's perfect, but <laughs> I know I'm not. Um, but that idea of um, grace is so important because we all we all sit in this place of, of grace. So in terms of standard and conduct and stuff like that, um, a great question for anyone to ask themselves. I am not here to be anyone's policeman. That's not my job. But a great question that I might ask someone is, uh, how is what you're doing revealing Jesus? Oh, good. Okay. How is what you're, you know, what you want to pursue, how is that, how is that revealing and glorifying him and honoring him? Because when we, when we come to faith, that really becomes our whole design, our new creation is to reveal Christ, each of us in our own unique way with our own gifts. And so how is what you are pursuing revealing Christ? I think is a good coaching question. Good. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And I mean, obviously, as if God were to guide you here, uh, there will be something put down on writing. Sure. I, I know you're going to work with yep. me on that and all those good things. But uh, I, I just... You know, it's important for us to hear that there is a standard. Sure. And there is a, it's going to be a good one, and uh, God will be a part of that. So to touch on that, some people might uh, wonder what form that will take. And um, basically in the past, what I've done is I have actually done a form with questions for people to fill in. And I know that might seem very stiff and uh, very formal, like why can't we just go out and have a coffee and just kind of talk like that, which we can. But there are some people that they actually need time to sit and ponder and think through their questions. And they like to have time to make sure what they're saying is accurate. And so I found that a sheet does one of two things. One, it enables people to reflect and very carefully communicate what is most important. And to be honest, the other thing is, if someone says they want to be on the worship team, but they won't take the time to fill out the worship form. Uh, it's a good way to weed people out. Like, if you're passionate about this, you're going to get it done. Right on. Yeah. Good, good. All right, so I got a couple of questions around uh, youth worship. Uh, Marion asked uh, and was wondering, what is your plan slash vision for the youth worship team? Sure. And, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about the fact that there has been almost, I'd call it a heritage here, of our young people being raised up in worship ministries and being trained and all those good things. Like, when you think of that, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, my personal history is when I was, like, a little, like, knee-high grasshopper boy, I had a lot of uh, adults. In my case, it was men in the church that invested in me. I think of Mr. Armstrong that taught me the drums. I think of Mr. Slaney that had me in the sound booth, and I started... Uh, I started with setting up the cassette tapes with a pencil. <laughs> so some of you don't know what cassette tapes are, and that dates me. But that was my job, is to get the tapes ready for recording. And that led to me being the, one of the main sound guys in our church. So I've had a personal history of people investing in me. And that's carried on through any of the ministries that I've been on in, in Orangeville. Uh, the idea that we've gone with is, if we have youth that are passionate and interested about getting involved... Let's let's open doors and give them wings. And what do you, what do you need to ser how, how, how what do you need to succeed, and how can we get you there? You may try something and not like it. That's okay. What are your passions? How can we help you contribute? Because we often make the mistake, and I hope I think Dan Martin would agree with this. We make the mistake of thinking that only adults have spiritual gifts to contribute to the life of the body. Well, if our youth are believers, the Scripture is very clear that they have the Holy Spirit in them. And he's given them gifts to use. And if we're not enabling them and empowering them to use their gifts, then our, our body is anemic. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and I would say, I mean, I know I'm biased, mm -hmm. but 
our youth and in fact our children in this church just rock so they're awesome and <laughs> involved nice. in all kinds of places um grace ann asked about a junior high uh worship team that was something that we had in the past um and she's just i know that she was a part of that sure and just wondering if that might be something that down the road we might see happen again sure i i don't see why not i'd like to ask Grace Ann what that looked like <laughs> and, and get a feel for what did you do with that worship team? Um, who was part of it? How did it contribute? Yeah. You know, so I think uh, some discussion, but um, that'd be great. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I had this other question come in. Um, how are you different today than you were one year ago? Oh, that's, uh, that is a really great question <laughs> because I think uh, as pastors, people think we're static in our growth that scott has always been and will always be wise and he'll <laughs> and he has attained this level of of maturity um but the reality is we're growing just like everyone else yeah. and so i would say the biggest change for me over the last year is understanding my identity in jesus and realizing that i don't have to perform to get him to love me more. And if I fail, he'll never love me less. He just loves me. And I don't have to strive. I just need to sit in that sweet pocket of being the beloved. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm called to do. I'm not called to make anyone else happy. And they're not called to make me happy. But I find my joy rooted in who I am. I'm the beloved of, of the Lord. And that's, uh, that's wow. been a massive freeing thing for me this year. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you, uh, Joe, uh, for answering those questions. Um, I, I'm hoping that uh, through the course of this weekend, especially Sunday morning, that you're going to be tuning in. Uh, you've got to hear Joe uh, on his own tonight, and then Sunday, obviously, he'll be leading with a bit of a bigger team uh, because we're getting this done early, so we, we, we can have early. a bigger team <laughs> to play with him, uh, and uh, that'll all be great. But I encourage you to tune in for that. Now, Joe, uh, we wanted to give you an opportunity uh, to kind of share your journey with sure. us yeah. um, w and your faith and how God has worked. And so we kind of give you a bit of a window to do that. So can I just turn it over to you and just allow you to kind of share your yeah, story with absolutely. us? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. So um, my story is probably like some of yours in terms of I grew up in a Christian home. And so church is something that was a familiar ground for me. I, I have to admit, I've always been puzzled, even when I was a kid, about what I heard in church and what I saw in church. Uh, they didn't seem to match. And, um, and that's not to poke fun at adults uh, uh, being inconsistent in their faith, but if you're always hearing about grace and love, but you're, you don't see that shared amongst how they treat each other, it makes you start to scratch your head and wonder, am I hearing the wrong thing or am I misunderstanding stuff? And so I remember my, the call to ministry, it came in two parts. The first part was uh, back when I was in grade 12, I had an incredible youth pastor. His name was uh, uh, Alan Nickel. And uh, that guy was just amazing. Anyways, he would drive from Niagara Falls to Niagara-on-the-Lake to sit on the step of the school with his bagged lunch to have lunch with me uh, at lunchtime. And uh, he had empowered me in, I was, I was actually in senior high two years early. <laughs> and he put me on the leadership team two years early. <laughs> and he, he really sewed into me. He really um, invested. And I remember this day in grade 12, I think he was, he was really hoping for a harvest and some fruit of this investment. And he, he sat there and he said, Joe, have you ever considered going into full-time ministry and becoming a pastor? And I laughed, and I said, oh, I would never do that. I mean, why would I ever, who would ever want to do that? <laughs> Have, I've seen how people treat pastors. Why would I ever want to become one? And uh, he was very gracious in the moment. <laughs> uh, but that answer hit, a, hit, a, hit the brick wall of reality when I went to uh, a secular school. You see, I'd gone to a Christian high school. And when I went to do my OAC, my Ontario Academic Credit, grade 13, again, that dates me. Um, but I went to our local high school and uh, to finish my credits. And when I was there, 
um, I saw my peers hate God. And I saw teachers in class aggressively speak about God in terms of hatred. And it was clear that they didn't know God at all. And my heart just broke. I, I, I grew up in church. I assumed that everyone had heard about Jesus and knew about God. And here I was, like, not literally a block down the road from my other high school. And people were searching, and they were hurting, and they were questioning and wondering, and there was no voice. And so I said, God, if that's what you have for me, then I, I will become a, a pastor. I'll, I'll, I'll enter into ministry. And so, um, definitely, uh, through the years, there has been a pattern of, of obedience and, and going into places that um, maybe friends and family would have kind of questions. Why would you go there? <laughs> I've been to Manitoba twice. <laughs> uh, the first time uh, we went to Manitoba, it's, it's actually interesting. Uh, my first position was the pastor of worship and youth. So, these questions about... Why would you do worship, and would you be in youth? I mean, that was my core first love, was worship in youth. And uh, at this church, um, we were only there 14 months. Within 14 months, we saw God move with great success. We went from one burned-out worship team to uh, three worship teams and a youth, be- a youth band. Mm. We saw the youth group grow from like 12 to like 30-plus kids. And it, in just a year, it was amazing. And um, of course, the other part of it that wasn't so amazing was uh, I didn't know that the senior pastor was working things behind the scenes. And um, actually, he became quite abusive uh, to me and to my wife. And so we ended up, I ended up resigning. Um, and it was very much a moment where uh, I wondered, why would I ever want to be in a church? And so we came back to Ontario and um, got involved in a church. Uh, I became an elder in the church. I um, was asked to take over the youth in the church. My wife was asked to take on the music. And what I didn't know was the pastor was playing power games, and he would actually fired the person that was doing the youth so I could take it on and fired the person doing the music so that Tanya could take it on, not knowing that those were the spouses. One was a board member and one was the spouse of a board member. And so uh, there were these power games going on. And I remember this, he said, uh, uh, when I was going to come on the board, he said, well, you need to know there's, you know, these, these elders are, you don't want to hook up with them. They're, you know, they're a little bit touchy about you right now. I'm like, I, I don't even know them. Why would they be touchy about me? And so that's the wrong... He goes, well, you shouldn't go speak to them. That's the wrong thing to say to me because I believe in unity in the body. So I went and then I heard what had happened. Eventually, we caught the pastor in lies and uh, ended up leaving the church. It was very dramatic. My wife's piano business, uh, teaching business, got decimated. We were basically um, uh, lepers (laughs) in, in the community because of rumors going around. And so I, we just said, you know what? That's it, God. Like, we're done. Church is, <laughs> we love you, but man, your church is a pill. And so, uh, <laughs> and so we left, and, and it wasn't probably a month later or so, I got a call from an elder, uh, one of the elders that left with me, and he said, you need to go to this little country church. He goes, the music is torturous, but the word of God being preached is incredible. And he was totally right. I said, okay, Tanya, go check it out. I mean, the music was, you had to survive it. Uh, But then when you got to the sermon, it was incredible. And it was like a miracle. Every Sunday, um, Ken, who has passed away, but he was my pastor, he would, in the Reformed Church, the pastor actually does the entire service from start to finish. MCs, everything. He led the worship. Yeah, everything. Wow. Absolutely everything. And what would happen is he would get up and he would start stuttering. Stutter, stutter, stutter through the whole service. And I remember sitting there the first Sunday going, oh my, this is going to be painful. Anyways, he opens the word of God and he begins to read. And his stuttering stops. And he starts preaching. And it was like the word of God burned in my chest. It was amazing. And then when he was done, he prayed. 
and they started stuttering again till the end of the service. <laughs> but we, we ended up going to this church because the Word of God was so transformative. And um, this was a couple, Ken and Kathy Ramsey, they, they took us in, they loved us, they healed us up, they didn't want us to serve, they just wanted us to be with them. And it was the first time I'd ever seen grace in the church. Uh, long story short, here's uh, some miracles about calling is, um, <laughs> after a, a tirade of me swearing like 10 sailors, and uh, you can ask me about that later, but, uh, and Ken being there, watching and talking with me two weeks after that he asked me to do pulpit supply and i'm like you what like were you there like did you hear what was going on anyways it set me on this path of doing pulpit supply for him and then his best friend asked me to do pulpit supply for him and then a friend of his asked me to do pulpit supply for him and ended up where i had the 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 gentleman who was the leader of all of canada calling me up asking me if i would go to a church in north york and pastor them through through shutting down which I couldn't believe. I was like, wow, this is crazy. I mean, I'm not getting back into ministry. I'd already applied to Brock University to become a history and English teacher. And uh, so I'm like, sure, I'll do this. So for about five months, we would drive every weekend to North York. Anyways, the church closed down. It was, a, it was an incredible ministry opportunity. And uh, during this time, uh, just kind of at the end of it, <clears throat> I had a gentleman uh, invite me out for coffee. He said, I want to pay for you to get into ministry. You need your master's. I'll pay a full shot. I'll wow. pay your living expenses. I'll pay your schooling. I'll pay your food. I'll pay your rent. I'll pay your car insurance. I said, well, if my glasses break, money will be in your account. I'll pay for your glasses. You'll want for nothing, but I think you are called to get back into the ministry. So I shared this with my, my pastor, Ken. And he said, I didn't even know. Are you interested in getting back into ministry? I said, oh, I mean, that's a great offer. I said, I, the one thing I've said to the Lord is I'm not going into debt. I'm, I've already been into debt once for ministry. I'm not doing it again. So Ken said, well, do you mind if I check things out? I said, no. Well, go, like, go for it. So about, about a month and a half later, Ken comes by and goes, okay, you start in August. I went, what? He goes, yeah, I've got your schooling paid for. We'll pay you for part-time at the church. The only thing you have to cover is um, your books and your board, your room and board. If you travel to Tyndale and need to stay the night, you need to cover that. Word got back to this church in North York that had closed down, that I, this is what's happening, and I got a call from them. We'd like to pay for all of your books. We'd like to pay wow. for all of your housing. Uh, we will cover the cost of you staying at school and getting through this. It was like, it was unbelievable. And it was like, well, how, how, God, how can I refuse your call when you have literally decimated every argument I had? And so that's really been these kind of paths, these am amazing miracle journeys. We went and did church revitalization. That was very hard, very difficult. And yet, you know, we saw God show up in amazing ways. And that was your second time back to Manitoba. Yeah, that was my second time back to Manitoba. Uh, I won't go a third time unless there's a serious, uh, <laughs> a serious wage being offered. But even then, it would be like, uh, I don't know. I've been, I have two T-shirts now. I don't need a third. So, um, yeah, so when we came back... Uh, we had applied to a different church in Orangeville, and they ended up actually, they loved us, but they go, you're too radical for us, but there is a church that's filled with people that are more like you, more crazy, and you'd be a good fit for there. So I didn't even apply to Covenant Alliance Church. Another church applied for me. <laughs> and so then I get a call, and whatever, soon I was like hired. It was just the most bizarre kind of call, and they have been the best church family we have ever been a part of. They uh, took us in from Winnipeg when we were broken, healed us up, loved us up. I learned that a church could actually maintain confidentiality. Hmm. I, I learned that a church could be filled with grace. A church could be filled with love. And they were just so incredible uh, as a church. They truly are a family. And so, yeah, the question about why would you shift yeah. from one place to another, it can only be because of calling. Because... I love them. They're, oh. they are, they are, they've been a heartbeat for nine and a half years. And so, um, you know, the, the interesting part, we've known each other for About nine and a half, nine years. And a half years. <laughs> and throughout the years, every year, I would say, okay, Scott, I'm going to bring my resume up. And you'd say, <laughs> okay, Joe, I'd never hire you. And I'd be like, why is there something wrong with me? And you'd be like, no, because you are called to Orangeville. 
the ministry that we see going on, the fruit that's going on there, we could not take you away from what is so clearly a calling on your life in Orangeville. And so, uh, actually, when I saw the posting for BAC, the job resonated with my personality. And yet, I'm like, I don't even know if Scott might just see my resume and circ- like put it in the circular file because he's, he, he's always told me he would never hire me. He would never even <laughs> consider me. And so, that you know, to go to uh, last year's um, workers' retreat, to be asked to lead worship, was like something got dumped into the furnace of my heart. And I'm like, wow, (laughs) I still have this raging passion for worship that has never stopped, but I really felt the draw and the call back to it. And so um, here we are today. Uh, You know I love you and respect you. And Julie is ridiculous. And so, uh, and and Dan Martin, his brain's way too big. I, I am just... This has always been a a leadership team that I've thought, wow, it would be incredible to be a part of that. And if that's the team at that church, I can only imagine the body is equally incredible. And so it's a pretty awesome church. (laughs) There you go. So that's really like, uh, I hope that answers some questions about my path and journey and call to apply. Why would I apply? Okay, so a, a question that others may be thinking Tanya. Yeah. Where does she come into the mix? That's a, Yeah, so Tanya in all of this, I mean, we have been ministry partners. She's often served in music. Um, from the time we met, I mean, we met in Austria. That's, oh. a, that's a story for another day. <laughs> yeah. uh, we met in Austria, and even in Austria, we were part of a music team that went around mm-hmm. Austria. When we were at Bible College, we, went, we were part of a team that went around Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, B.C., and into Montana. Like, we've always been doing ministry yeah. together. And so um, her, at this point in time, um, the transition here, should we get the position, would be good for her to actually breathe and take a break. Because yeah. she's carried a, a significant load at yeah. Covenant uh, Alliance Church. And so um, for her to have a breather and just be part of the church family, get to know, build relationships, yep. Yep. I think it's probably her season to do that. Yeah. And we have two cats they're very spoiled. We do not have children. We found out that we couldn't have children. And so we've... And so you're cat people. We are cat people. And everybody knows that we're dog people in the Fittermore yeah. house. So this could be tense. And, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, the defining... You'll be able to bring your pets the defining, over. And... The defining factor is that uh, both of our cats are toilet trained. So... Well, that's impressive. I know. I know. So they are. They, yeah. So yeah, awesome. do that with your dogs and they'll yeah. talk. <laughs> Uh, I just want you guys uh, to know that uh, when Joe mentioned uh, when he started here in this district, it's funny, it was the very first prayer retreat, staff retreat, that we had gone on <clears throat> since I, we had been at Bramley Alliance Church. And Dave and Julie came with us. It's the very first one we all went to. And because uh, before that, we, it, we couldn't afford to send anyone. But we went to that, and that's where I first met Joe and Tanya. Was that uh, Niagara Falls? Yeah, it was Niagara Falls. And we actually prayed over Joe and Tanya that That's night. That's right. And that was the first time I met him. I had no idea that we would be put in a network together um, and then actually do road trips and things like that. And, you mm. know, Joe saying, hey, I'm going to send you my resume. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and well, I know when I got the call from you, I was actually on one of my study weeks. And I was like, no way. You got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's really happening. And God has been taking you on a journey, yeah. but he's also been taking us on a journey as well. And for myself personally, too, of kind of seeking God out, seeing where he's going and whether or not this would be a fit. It's just and just so you know, church family, that this is I have mentioned at the beginning, the strangest candidating weekend ever. And I'm just hoping and trusting that um, mm. as you get to know Joe a little bit through the video and uh, watching online that you will get a sense uh, of the heart that he has. Uh, Also, just keep in mind, too, that the search committee, which was made up of Peter Graham, uh, Pam uh, Grant, and Michelle Sood, all put his name forward as the one we would recommend. I was on that as well uh, for this position. And it's been a journey. And uh, we just ask you to continue to pray and uh, that if God will guide uh, the elders 
as we continue to move forward with this. But Joe, I am, I'm so thankful for you coming, uh, spending this time with us, and uh, talking to the, the congregation, you know, online. But, uh, and, and again, I just want to shout out to Dietmar and Peter uh, Graham, who are up in the sound booth, who are recording this and helping us make everything work tonight. Big so, time, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. All right, anything else you want to say before we say goodbye? Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I don't have it in front of me, but probably um, if I was to capture my heart in ministry, uh, it's that idea of that we are on a journey. And uh, God holds my hand as I go on this journey. And he, he asks me to live from Christ through the Spirit because I've been designed to serve him in a certain way. And my call in ministry is to walk alongside of others, point them to Jesus, help them discover that they are God's workmanship, and, and help them to find what is the good works that God has created in advance for you to do, and how can I help you get there? Because at the end of the day, the mark of discipling, the mark of a church is love. And so this idea of walking alongside of someone as they grow in Jesus, as they grow as a believer— it needs to be done with love. And when we're loved, we love. And so that whole idea of just sitting in that pocket uh, of being loved is so crucial. And so that would be what I would close off with is uh, cool. that's my heart to walk alongside people, point them to Jesus, cool. and help them grow. Well, let me just close off in prayer. You can say seated. You've been standing all day. <laughs> and it's kind of sad that I'm not much taller than you when I stand up. So... <laughs> Let me just close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this evening and the opportunity that we've had to get to know Joe a little bit better. God, I want to pray um, that you would just bless him and uh, Tanya. Lord, I thank you for the fact that he felt comfortable to share his life and to share the hurts that he has gone through, uh, some of them actually in ministry. And Lord, all of us mm. have walked uh, our own journeys, and we know what hurt is like. Thank you for the fact, Lord, that you have watched over Joe and you have brought him through those things. And, Lord, that now you've brought him here to Bramley Alliance Church and this family. Uh, and, God, it, it may be for such a time as this. Hmm. And, Lord, I just want to ask that you would guide and direct uh, the elders of our church. Lord, I pray for other comments that might come uh, that people can send in to, to the uh, BA Church uh, office at BA Church uh, email and so we can hear from people in the church about Joe as we seek to make a wise choice. And Father God, I pray that you would um, just have your hand upon Joe and Tanya and bless them, Lord, for their willingness to be obedient to you. Father, uh, thank you for everyone who uh, signed in tonight and uh, was a part of this. And God, I pray that you would just guide and direct us. We want to follow you, Jesus, mm. and we want to do what you would have us do. So I just pray, Lord, uh, for all the resources we need and uh, the courage to say yes when you say follow me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Just and so you know, that was not social distancing. Oh, no. Uh, Sorry. Did I, I think I might have actually <laughs> spit on you or something. <laughs> so don't get close to me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you all for tuning in tonight. And check it out Sunday morning, 10 a.m. as well, uh, online. We'll Sounds see you good. then. All right. Cheers.